My name is Alex Williams, founder of the New Stack, and you're listening to the New Stack podcast from Cloud Native Day, brought to you by Cisco. Check out Mantle, Cisco's open source microservices infrastructure, pulling together the best of open source projects, including Docker, Kubernetes, and Ansible. Learn more at mantle.io. That's M A N T L.io. Hey, it's Alex Williams with the New Stack. Here at Cloud Native Day, just was talking here with Brandon Phillips, CTO and co-founder of CoreOS. It's a very long week, but here we are, you know, in the in in the stretch. And I want to just you know spend some time talking with you. We're looking, you know, today to kind of talk about scale in Kubernetes and getting into the some of the more interesting particulars about Kubernetes and where it's going. And I think in particular, our interest with you is about etcd, mm -hmm. you know, and etcd's direction. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we can spend a little time, you know, you could spend a little time explaining what etcd is for people who may not know, mm -hmm. and then talking about, you know, where it is now and, and where you want to take it. For sure. So for those who aren't familiar, etcd is a consensus database. What that means is that uh, inside of a data center, particularly when you start to talk about clustering, one of the first things you want to avoid is ensuring any one machine in the cluster is so special that if it goes down, it takes out all of your other computers from doing the useful work that they want to do. Um, so what etcd does is it's a, it's a database where you can write in stuff and then it gets replicated to a set of machines, generally around like five to seven machines. And uh, through some other mechanisms, we can like replicate that and, and give streams of updates to other machines within the, in the cluster. And the reason we talk about etcd so much is because uh, Kubernetes and a num number of other cloud native projects have adopted etcd as their primary data store, as the place that they hold on to all the important information they hope doesn't get lost uh, in case of an outage or et cetera. So with etcd, um, the latest developments that we've had over the last few months is that about two months ago, we released etcd v3, which is designed, and we worked really close with the Kubernetes team uh, since we work really closely upstream uh, in a variety of capacities in, in Kubernetes to figure out what are the things that Kubernetes needs uh, moving forward in order to scale to really, really large cluster sizes. And so we're pretty confident at this point that like, etcd is the most performant uh, database of this type in the open source space and that we've added features that will ensure that Kubernetes is able to scale up to the tens and twenty thousands size of clusters. Um, and really the bottleneck now is improving Kubernetes. The database is ready to support those sorts of sizes and workloads. So, uh, so what size did you say again that you were talking about scaling to with Kubernetes? That, that like, 10, 20, 30,000 yeah. size clusters. So number of machines in the cluster actively taking workloads. Um, what What do you need to do to etcd to, to make that possible? Yeah, so there's a few things that we've done since etcd v2 mm -hmm. to etcd v3. Um, one of which is we uh, greatly reduced the memory overhead of storing stuff in etcd. So it uh, used to be 8x, so 800% of whatever you stored was the overhead of etcd, uh, and now it's about 30%, so it's a pretty good improvement. Um, and then uh, we've done a bunch of work to ensure that the um, latency of the system is really, really tight, and that um, even when the system is encountering uh, constrained environments or per perhaps network failures, that the cluster continues to make good forward progress. So. It's just a bunch of improvements all over the map to to ensure that the database is working correctly. Because uh, the first thing we have to do is ensure the system works correctly, and then is as performant as we can possibly make it. And we're getting pretty close to the like diminishing returns on performance uh, improvements inside of this style of database. So. Uh, so you're talking about reaching those diminishing returns. Well, is is there something around that that you'll have to overcome or or I'm, I'm just curious about what it would mean to reach that and how you, that would be overcome. Yeah, for sure. So a system like etcd relies on um, what are called consistence algorithms um, or replicated state machines. And these things are um, they're constrained by how quickly the m machines in the cluster are able to communicate. And so uh, 
once you get the system up to the point where you're fully compressing all the payloads and that you have really, really efficient like memory indexes, um, now you're constrained by how quickly you can write stuff to disk and then how quickly things can communicate over the network. And we're getting to that point where you're like getting to the limits of, well, the database is optimally consuming the network and disk resources. So the next step is, um, is actually making it easier to use and easier to replicate the data. And so there are a lot of reasons that inside of Kubernetes and systems that rely on etcd you want to take the data that is in etcd but stream copies of it off to other people who might be caching that or doing service discovery work or configuring load balancers. And so that's where we're starting to build libraries and tools to make it really easy for people to not necessarily write into etcd but avoid pounding etcd with reads. Um, and so it's just a uh, pretty classic database strategy of, of moving the problem outside of the database and making it easier for people to consume the, the, the data in a way that doesn't consume resources on the database. In Kubernetes, are there other components besides database tooling that face this similar problem of diminishing returns at scale? Um, so there's a lot of work that uh, we've been working upstream to do uh, that can help to improve Kubernetes internals. Uh, so the storage layer and the caching layers and those sorts of things are really the focus over probably the next couple of releases. So Kubernetes aggressively caches, um, but we spend a lot of time actually with duplicate caches inside of the code base. Um, so if anyone's used Kubernetes, you'll know that the experience is uh, really fast, really dynamic. If you del delete something in the system, uh, it reacts within you know, a second or less. And so it feels like a very, very fast system, but there's always things that we can do to make it more memory efficient and CPU efficient. And those, those are the places where you start to get uh, scaling bottlenecks, um, where we're kind of frivolously uh, using resources. But even today, Kubernetes scales up to, right now in the 1.3, 1.4 releases, like 1, 2, 3,000 machine clusters, which for a lot of people is way more than they need. And one of the important things I always repeat is that Kubernetes also scales down to one machine clusters mm -hmm. uh, because not everyone is in the state where they need a thousand hosts, but I think pretty much everyone's in the state where they need APIs that Kubernetes provides to help them with application lifecycle, uh, figuring out the security stance of their systems, better consuming the resources that they are spending through capital expenditure or through their uh, cloud providers. And so, um, yeah, even though we, we're talking a ton about scaling, Kubernetes isn't just all about scaling, it's also creating like a usable experience for this consuming this type of infrastructure. So what is the evolving role of the network mm -hmm. then when you're thinking about etcd and its evolution? Yeah, so there's kind of two pieces. One is that uh, etcd relies on essentially the network in order to do its, its job. It needs to have a nice, well understood, well modeled network so that uh, system administrators can say, the expectation of the network is that it's gonna have this latency and this bandwidth and etcd understands that so that um, the system is able to give correct monitoring and alerting to users. So uh, understanding your network is kind of step one. We have very uh, reasonable defaults and good monitoring tools to help you understand your network. So that's kind of step one. And the other step is that uh, you're seeing a lot of networking tools starting to uh, consume etcd. So actually um, using etcd as a coordination point for setting up and configuring these sort of cloud na native networks. So uh, things like OVS, the um, Open vSwitch, uh, and OVN are, are looking at using etcd. Um, projects like Project Calico are already, already using etcd. Flannel is already using etcd. So on the other side, like etcd uses the network and then on the other side for setting up these cloud native like container enabled networking systems a lot of those systems are consuming etcd either directly through etcd or indirectly by using the kubernetes apis so. okay you know and when you think about um um you know the the networking uh challenges um how do you think about kind of like you know, the interfaces then to, uh, you know, the, the plugins, for example, into like larger kind of networking architectures. Yeah, so that's uh, that's something I'll be talking about at my talk here, but one of the things that we've been really interested in is we provide an enterprise stack uh, built on Kubernetes called Tectonic, and we want to ensure that depending on like the enterprises and what vendors they've chosen, we want to ensure that they're able to plug in whatever networking or storage or identity that they have. And so, 
uh, one of the things that we built with the community is this thing called the Container Networking Interface, which CNI, CNI which allows Kubernetes to plug in different vendors. So, you know, Cisco Contiv has a CNI plugin, right. Weaveworks, et cetera, et cetera. They all have CNI plugins. So, no matter who the networking vendor is that the enterprise wants to work with, we want to have a nice clean interface so that they can plug Kubernetes into that environment and Kubernetes can get the network resources that it needs. Is there that clean interface with Docker then? Yeah, there is a, a sort of similar interface called Lib Network. Um, so how do you yeah how do you correlate, correlate that if, if everyone's going to CNI, for example? Yeah, so CNI has a slightly different model. Uh, it's much more uh, it's much less of an abstraction, so it exposes a lot more power of the actual Linux operating system and the networking capabilities of Linux. And then CNI has a bit of a market advantage here with uh, systems like Mesos, uh, Cloud Foundry, and Kubernetes um, adopting it. And a lot of the, the vendors, like I mentioned earlier, um, Project Calico, Cisco, Weave, et cetera, adopting it inside of their products. Um, so it's one of those things where we have a little bit of a competition of uh, APIs. Um, I'm pretty confident in the design and implementation and momentum behind CNI. We'll just have to see how it shakes out in the open source space and um, which which implementation and which sort of uh, convention in, ends up being the the one that people choose by default when they're building new new networking products. When we were uh, first talking about uh, networking, yep. uh, you also mentioned the need to have uh, essentially a good monitoring setup. Yep. Um, we are looking into this more in our fifth ebook, uh, mm -hmm. talking about container monitoring. Is there anything? Uh, really specific to Kubernetes for monitoring that is maybe different from generalized container monitoring best practices? Mm. The, the, the one thing that Kubernetes has a pretty wide advantage on um, being a kind of complete orchestration stack is that through its service discovery mechanisms and through the knowledge that it has of the application, through how the developer expresses, oh, this application has this dependency and this deployment, and you're able, and it has these health monitoring endpoints, uh, you're able to scrape a lot of this metadata and provide monitoring automatically. Mm -hmm. A lot of the basic monitoring that you would usually manually configure with Nagios if, uh, if you're using that or some of the agents that you can buy and use from various vendors. And so um, what, we, we, what we've been investing time and effort in is an open source project called Prometheus, mm -hmm. which uh, Kubernetes exposes kind of in a native metric format that Prometheus can consume a lot of these basic operational metrics that people are interested in. And then it's really, really trivial for you to also expose metrics that Prometheus can consume from your application. And then Kubernetes has metadata of where your application is, what its IP address is, where its health endpoint is, and Prometheus can just, without configuration, start to consume those. Um, we actually did a great blog post just a couple days ago on etcd plus Prometheus monitoring. So mm. complex database, distributed, runs inside of Kubernetes, how do you like monitor that and alert on it and that sort of thing. And uh, you'll see this, it's not necessarily about the implementation of Prometheus, but it's this pattern of exposing certain sets of metrics out of your application. Um, and Kubernetes is kind of leading the way as like an app itself mm -hmm. and it exposing useful metrics from itself um, to, to the uh, system administrator and developer. Yeah, I was going to ask about etcd specifically with Prometheus. Is that something you guys are going to be giving more attention as we go on? I mean, I know Prometheus was donated relatively recently, so I, I wondered if there was still a lot to happen there. Yeah, so Prometheus has really good momentum behind it, um, and what we're doing is we're integrating it um, into, uh, into our Tectonic product. We're ensuring that Kubernetes is making best practice usages of how to export metrics. And then we're building upstream a lot of like how-to guides on what are the best practices for monitoring Kubernetes. How do you know your Kubernetes is healthy? When should you start alerting and paging somebody that your thing is unhealthy? And essentially, it's a, it's a combination of technology and then also setting up uh, and giving expectations to operators of how do I, how do I run this thing in production? Um, and that's, that's what we're hoping to do with Prometheus um, and, and that sort of integration and work. One question I always have about monitoring, and especially now you're talking about integration with complex consensus database such as etcd is how do you visualize all this yeah so this is one thing that um, we think a lot about and uh, the first thing that you want to do is sort of encourage 
the applications to provide some defaults. And so what we do, like in the in the blog post we wrote about etcd, is we're like, here are the five important graphs that you should probably have. Like here are the five important queries of information that you should probably have. And we want to kind of make this a pattern. Like here are the five important things inside of Kubernetes you should be watching. Here, the, and so. Really, uh, Prometheus provides integrations with things like Grafana to graph this stuff, and then like a sort of like a SQL query language, so you can generate a useful uh, time series. Uh, who's the? Uh, who is it? Barack who's developing a time series database, but it's, I don't know if there's any curler. <laughs> yeah, so the we have two folks. Uh, Frederick and Fabian in our Berlin office working on Prometheus in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and so Prometheus itself is a time series database uh, of, ah, okay. of its own, so. Okay, interesting. Um, so from that, you know, so the UI is a you know, consideration and we're hearing more kind of topics about, we're hearing Grafana come up more and more. And, uh, where does telemetry play a role in all this, you know, in terms of, because we're really talking about trying to b better understand the hardware and the software now, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, like, hardware telemetry is is part of this, and we, um, Kubernetes has a number of different ways of expo exposing, like, how healthy is the CPU, and then maybe, like, performance metrics about your CPU or your memory or your cache hits or those, those sorts of important, like, impacting, uh, key performance indicators of your system. And so really there's like two parts of the system. There are things about exporting those metrics and gathering those metrics, and then there's things about time series and alerting on those metrics. And so for me, this is about the time series stuff and alerting, and then there's a lot of different projects that are just doing a great job, like Seed Advisor, uh, which mm -hmm. is part of Kubernetes, of just here's all the metrics uh, that are coming off the box. I really want somebody Somebody else needs to gather it up, but here are the metrics. Here's an API for consuming those metrics. Please do something useful with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it takes both sides for sure. Uh, I actually kind of want to circle back around to something. Um, we kind of talked at the very beginning of this discussion uh, about really some of the projects you're working on with uh, making Kubernetes scale or making it more effective, mm -hmm. etcd being one of those. Uh, is there anything else that's kind of being worked on right now that you see as key to helping Kubernetes move forward? Yeah, a big one is that uh, we want Kubernetes to feel like a system that you can confidently operate in production. And what we're doing today is a uh, bunch of work with Upstream. We're calling it, uh, it's kind of being branded as self-hosted. And so the idea here is that uh, Kubernetes has a number of components, and this is a huge boon to the product. So. As an example, um, I'll be in front of a customer, they'll be saying, well, we like Kubernetes, but we want a different DNS server. Like, it's not a problem. DNS isn't built into Kubernetes. It's provided by default. It's a separate service. You can pull that out and integrate with whatever DNS you have internally in your enterprise. Now, what that leads to is some perception that Kubernetes is this complex beast. And what we want to do is make it so that um, using the exact same APIs that make Kubernetes so powerful for managing applications, using those same APIs to manage Kubernetes itself. So what we're going to be doing over the next few months is making it so that um, it's as simple as talking to the Kubernetes API and saying, I want to upgrade from mm -hmm. v136 of this large distributed system to v14 of this large distributed system. And not just making it like a magical one-click experience, but actually emitting events, allowing for rollback and that sort of thing. Um, and this is an important piece. Like building a distributed system is one one thing, and we've learned this with etcd and all the other distributed systems we built at CoreOS. But once it engages with the enterprise environment, with the customers, etc., you need something that people can confidently operate, um, and you have to show that story. That's like one of the more important stories in order to get over the line from, hey, it worked on my laptop, neat demo. Uh, I, I want to run this and I want to like say, if this thing goes down and I get paged, I know what to do to fix it. And uh, we think the work that we're doing upstream uh, with everybody in self-hosted is the uh, imp important milestone um, and first step to that. We have a, a nice blog post on coros.com explaining that with a video and everything. And I think just in conclusion, I mean, you know, CoreOS has really come a long way in the past year, right? Mm -hmm. And etcd has been a, a, a technology has been very powerful and very um, important to the overall community, mm -hmm. right? 
what is your responsibility? I, you know, when it concerns SCD, mm-hmm. and what is what? What do you what do you think is important for it to be something that has health over the long term, not just for CoreOS, but the overall ecosystem? Yeah, that's something we we think a lot about. So, we work with tons of different communities. We have maintainers from other companies inside of etcd, like CockroachDB relies on parts of etcd, um, our raft algorithm. We have folks from like NTT Telecom who maintain the authentication and authorization systems. Um, we do a ton of work. Uh, we do functional testing where we work with the Google Cloud team to ensure that every day we have a set of three or four etcd clusters that are getting their network partition, their disks are failing, they're getting added and removed from the cluster to ensure that the product, as it develops, continues to provide those high reliability guarantees that it was designed to provide. And so it's a combination of ensuring that we are extremely diligent in in delivering a product that actually does what it says on the box, and then building a legitimate open source project around it where it's not just a CoreOS project, but it involves other key stakeholders inside of this whole cloud native community. Um, people who show up and actually want to do the work, we're super happy to engage them and make them uh, maintainers and give them ownership over over etcd code base. Does it require, do you think it will require at some point for you to, you know, have it be managed by another entity? Yeah, I mean, we'll figure that out. Right now we're doing like, a fine job. We're able to manage mm-hmm. uh, that community with uh, with uh, the maintainers and the general open source goodwill that CoreOS ha- holds on yeah. all of our projects. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we're kind of in a uh, an era where uh, there's a lot of different models for open source, and um, and it, it as long as there's like trust and goodwill, it, it generally works out in a good way um, for everyone involved. Well, Brandon, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, it's always uh, great to talk with you. You provide a technical perspective that we really like to have with the new stack, and CoreOS has just been really burning it up, so congratulations on that, and, and we look forward to keeping in touch and following, following your guys' progress. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yep. You're listening to the new stack podcast from Cloud Native Day, brought to you by Cisco. Check out Mantle. Cisco's open source microservices infrastructure, pulling together the best of open source projects, including Docker, Kubernetes, and Ansible. Learn more at mantle.io. That's M A N T L.io.